Chapter 1, Part 5 of The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Lewis Ginsburg. All Things Praise the Lord. Whatever God created has value. Even the animals and the insects, that seem useless and noxious at first sight, have a vocation to fulfill. The snail, trailing a moist streak after it as it crawls, and so using up its vitality, serves as a remedy for boils. The sting of a hornet is healed by the housefly, crushed and applied to the wound. The gnat, feeble creature, taking in a food but never secreting it, is a specific against the poison of a viper, and this venomous reptile itself cures eruptions, while the lizard is the antidote to the scorpion. Not only do all creatures serve man and contribute to his comfort, but also God teacheth us through the beasts of the earth and maketh us wise through the fowls of heaven. He endowed many animals with admirable moral qualities as a pattern for man. If the Torah had not been revealed to us, we might have learnt regard for the decencies of life from the cat who covers her excrement with earth, regard for the property of others from the ants who never encroach upon one another's stores, and regard for decorous conduct from the cock who, when he desires to unite with the hen, promises to buy her a cloak long enough to reach the ground, and when the hen reminds him of his promise, he shakes his comb and says, May I be deprived of my comb? if I do not buy it when I have the means. The grasshopper also has a lesson to teach to man. All the summer through it sings, until its belly bursts and death claims it. Though it knows the fate that awaits it, yet it sings on. So man should do his duty toward God, no matter what the consequences. The stork should be taken as a model in two respects. He guards the purity of his family life zealously and towards his fellows he is compassionate and merciful. Even the frog can be the teacher of man. By the side of the water there lives a species of animals which subsist off aquatic creatures alone. When the frog notices that one of them is hungry, he goes to it of his own accord and offers himself as food, thus fulfilling the injunction, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. The whole of creation was called into existence by God unto his glory, and each creature has its own hymn of praise wherewith to extol the Creator. Heaven and earth, paradise and hell, desert and field, rivers and seas, all have their own way of paying homage to God. The hymn of the earth is, From the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, glory to the righteous. The sea exclaims, Above the voices of many waters, the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Also, the celestial bodies and the elements proclaim the praise of their Creator. The sun, moon, and stars, the clouds and the winds, lightning and dew. The sun says, The sun and moon stood still in their habitation at the light of thine arrows, as they went at the shining of thy glittering spear. And the stars sing, Thou art the Lord, even thou alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all things that are thereon, the seas and all that is in them, and thou preservest them all. And the host of heaven worshippeth thee. Every plant, furthermore, has a song of praise. The fruitful tree sings, then shall all the trees of the wood sing for joy before the Lord, for he is cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. And the ears of grain on the field sing, the pastures are covered with flocks, the valleys are also covered over with corn. They shout for joy, they also sing. Great among singers of praise are the birds, and greatest among them is the cock. When God at midnight goes to the pious in paradise, all the trees therein break out into adoration, and their songs awaken the cock, who begins, in turn, to praise God. 
Seven times he crows, each time reciting a verse. The first verse is, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. The second verse, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, yea, lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. The third. Arise, ye righteous, and occupy yourselves with the Torah, that your reward may be abundant in the world hereafter. The fourth. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. The fifth. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? The sixth. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. And the seventh verse, sung by the cock, runs, It is time to work for the Lord, for they have made void thy law. The song of the vulture is, I will hiss for them, and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. The same verse, with which the bird will in time, come to announce the advent of the Messiah. The only difference being that when he heralds the Messiah, he will sit upon the ground and sing his verse, while at all other times he is seated elsewhere when he sings it. Nor do the other animals praise God less than the birds. Even the beasts of prey give forth adoration. The lion says, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, he shall shout aloud. He shall do mightily against his enemies. And the fox exhorts unto justice with the words, Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by injustice, that useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not his hire. Yea, the dumb fishes know how to proclaim the praise of their Lord. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters, they say. The God of glory thundereth, even the Lord, upon many waters. While the frog exclaims, Blessed be the name of the glory of his kingdom for ever and ever. Contemptible though they are, even the reptiles give praise unto their creator. The mouse extols God with the words, Howbeit thou art just in all that is come upon me, for thou hast dealt truly, but I have done wickedly. And the cat sings, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. End of chapter 1「Part 1 of The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. Chapter 2 Adam. Man and the World. With ten sayings, God created the world, although a single saying would have sufficed. God desired to make known how severe the punishment to be meted out to the wicked, who destroy a world created with as many as ten sayings, and how goodly the reward destined for the righteous, who preserve a world created with as many as ten sayings. The world was made for man, though he was the last comer among its creatures. This was design. He was to find all things ready for him. God was the host who prepared dainty dishes, set the table, and then led his guests to his seat. At the same time, man's late appearance on earth is to convey an admonition to humility. Let him beware of being proud, lest he invite the retort that the gnat is older than he. The superiority of man to the other creatures is apparent in the very manner of his creation, although different from theirs. He is the only one who was created by the hand of God. The rest sprang from the word of God. The body of man is a microcosm, the whole world in miniature, 
and the world in turn is a reflex of man. The hair upon his head corresponds to the woods of the earth, his tears to a river, his mouth to the ocean. Also the world resembles the ball of his eye. The ocean that encircles the earth is like unto the white of the eye. The dry land is the iris, Jerusalem the pupil, and the temple the image mirrored in the pupil of the eye. But man is more than a mere image of this world. He unites both heavenly and earthly qualities within himself. In four he resembles the angels, in four the beasts. His power of speech, his discriminating intellect, his upright walk, the glance of his eye, they all make an angel of him. But, on the other hand, he eats and drinks, secretes the waste matter in his body, propagates his kind, and dies, like the beast of the field. Therefore, God said before the creation of man, The celestials are not propagated, but they are immortal. The beings on earth are propagated, but they die. I will create man to be the union of the two, so that when he sins, when he behaves like a beast, death shall overtake him. But if he refrains from sin, he shall live for ever. God now bade all beings in heaven and on earth contribute to the creation of man, and he himself took part in it. Thus they will all love man, and if he should sin, they will be interested in his preservation. The whole world naturally was created for the pious, the God-fearing man, whom Israel produces with the helpful guidance of the law of God revealed to him. It was, therefore, Israel who was taken into special consideration at the time man was made. All other creatures were instructed to change their nature, if Israel should ever need their help in the course of his history. The sea was ordered to divide before Moses, and the heavens to give ear to the words of the leader. The sun and moon were bidden to stand still before Joshua, the ravens to feed Elijah, the fire to spare the three youths in the furnace, and the lion to do no harm to Daniel, the fish to spew forth Jonah, and the heavens to open before Ezekiel. In his modesty, God took counsel with the angels before the creation of the world, regarding his intention of making man. He said, For the sake of Israel I will create the world. As I shall make a division between light and darkness, so I will, in time to come, do for Israel and Egypt. Thick darkness shall be over the land, and the children of Israel shall have light in their dwellings. As I shall make a separation between the waters under the firmament and the waters above the firmament, so I will do for Israel. I will divide the waters for him when he crosses the Red Sea. As on the third day I shall create plants, so I will do for Israel. I will bring forth manna for him in the wilderness. As I shall create luminaries to divide day from night, so I will do for Israel. I will go before him by day in a pillar of cloud, and by night in a pillar of fire. As I shall create the fowl of the air and the fishes of the sea, so I will do for Israel. I will bring quails for him from the sea. And as I shall breathe the breath of life into the nostrils of man, so I will do for Israel. I will give the Torah unto him, the tree of life. The angels marveled that so much love should be lavished upon this people of Israel. And God told them, On the first day of creation I shall make the heavens and stretch them out so will Israel raise up the tabernacle as the dwelling place of my glory. On the second day I shall put a division between the terrestrial waters and the heavenly waters. So will he hang up a veil in the tabernacle to divide the holy place and the most holy. On the third day I shall make the earth put forth grass and herb. So will he, in obedience to my commands, eat herbs on the first night of the Passover, and prepare showbread for me. On the fourth day I shall make the luminaries, so will he make a golden candlestick for me. On the fifth day I shall create the birds, so will he fashion the cherubim with outstretched wings. On the sixth day I shall create man, so will Israel set aside a man of the sons of Aaron as high priest for my service. 
Accordingly, the whole of creation was conditional. God said to the things he made on the first six days, If Israel accepts the Torah, you will continue and endure. Otherwise, I shall turn everything back into chaos again. The whole world was thus kept in suspense and dread until the day of the revelation on Sinai, when Israel received and accepted the Torah, and so fulfilled the condition made by God at the time when he created the universe. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg The Angels and the Creation of Man God, in his wisdom, having resolved to create man, he asked counsel of all around him before he proceeded to execute his purpose. An example to man, be he never so great and distinguished, not to scorn the advice of the humble and lonely. First God called upon heaven and earth, then upon all other things he had created, and last upon the angels. The angels were not all of one opinion. The angel of love favored the creation of man, because he would be affectionate and loving. But the angel of truth opposed it, because he would be full of lies. And while the angel of justice favored it, because he would practice justice, the angel of peace opposed it, because he would be quarrelsome. To invalidate his protest, God cast the angel of truth down from heaven to earth, and when the others cried out against such contemptuous treatment of their companion, he said, Truth will spring back out of the earth. The objections of the angels would have been much stronger had they known the whole truth about man. God had told them only about the pious, and had concealed from them that there would be reprobates among mankind too. And yet, though they knew but half the truth, the angels were nevertheless prompted to cry out, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? God replied, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, what were they created for? Of what avail a larder full of appetizing dainties, and no guests to enjoy them? And the angels could not but exclaim, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth! Do as is pleasing in thy sight. For not a few of the angels, their opposition bore fatal consequences. When God summoned the band under the archangel Michael, and asked their opinion on the creation of man, they answered scornfully, What is man, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him? God thereupon stretched forth his little finger, and all were consumed by fire, except their chief Michael. And the same fate befell the band under the leadership of the archangel Gabriel. He alone of all was saved from destruction. The third band consulted was commanded by the archangel Labiel. Taught by the horrible fate of his predecessors, he warned his troop, You have seen what misfortune overtook the angels who said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Let us have a care not to do likewise, lest we suffer the same dire punishment. For God will not refrain from doing in the end what he has planned. Therefore it is advisable for us to yield to his wishes. Thus warned, the angels spoke, Lord of the world, it is well that thou hast thought of creating man. Do thou create him according to thy will. And as for us, we will be his attendants and his ministers, and reveal unto him all our secrets. Thereupon God changed Labiel's name to Raphael, the rescuer, because his host of angels had been rescued by his sage advice. He was appointed the angel of healing, who has in his safekeeping all the celestial remedies, the types of the medical remedies used on earth. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg The Creation of Adam When at last the ascent of the angels to the creation of man was given, God said to Gabriel, Go and fetch me dust from the four corners of the earth, and I will create man therewith. Gabriel went forth to do the bidding of the Lord, but the earth drove him away, and refused to let him gather up dust from it. Gabriel remonstrated, Why, O earth, 
Dost thou not hearken unto the voice of the Lord, who founded thee upon the waters without props or pillars? The earth replied, and said, I am destined to become a curse, and to be cursed through man, and if God himself does not take the dust from me, no one else shall ever do it. When God heard this, he stretched out his hand, took of the dust of the ground, and created the first man therewith. Of set purpose, the dust was taken from all four corners of the earth, so that if a man from the east should happen to die in the west, or a man from the west in the east, the earth should not dare refuse to receive the dead, and tell him to go whence he was taken. When a man chances to die, and wheresoever he is buried, there he will return to the earth from which he sprang. Also the dust was of various colors, red, black, white, and green, red for the blood, black for the bowels, white for the bones and veins, and green for the pale skin. At this early moment the Torah interfered. She addressed herself to God. O Lord of the world, the world is thine, thou canst do with it as seemeth good in thine eyes. But the man thou art now creating will be few of days and full of trouble and sin. If it be not thy purpose to have forbearance and patience with him, it were better not to call him into being. God replied, Is it for naught I am called long-suffering and merciful? The grace and loving-kindness of God revealed themselves particularly in his taking one spoonful of dust from the spot where, in time to come, the altar would stand, saying, I shall take man from the place of atonement, that he may endure. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Lewis Ginsburg The Soul of Man the care which God exercised in fashioning every detail of the body of man is as naught in comparison with his solicitude for the human soul. The soul of man was created on the first day, for it is the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters. Thus, instead of being the last, man is really the first work of creation. This spirit, or to call it by its usual name, the soul of man, possesses five different powers. By means of one of them, she escapes from the body every night, rises up to heaven, and fetches new life thence for man. With the soul of Adam, the souls of all the generations of men were created. They are stored up in a promptuary, in the seventh of the heavens, whence they are drawn as they are needed for human body after human body. The soul and body of man are united in this way. When a woman has conceived, the angel of the night, Layla, carries the sperm before God, and God decrees what manner of human being shall become of it, whether it shall be male or female, strong or weak, rich or poor, beautiful or ugly, long or short, fat or thin, and what all its other qualities shall be. Piety and wickedness alone are left to the determination of man himself. Then God makes a sign to the angel appointed over the souls, saying, Bring me the soul so-and-so, which is hidden in paradise, whose name is so-and-so, and whose form is so-and-so. The angel brings the designated soul, and she bows down when she appears in the presence of God, and prostrates herself before him. At that moment, God issues the command, Enter this sperm. The soul opens her mouth, and pleads, O Lord of the world, I am well pleased with the world in which I have been living since the day on which thou didst call me into being. Why dost thou now desire to have me enter this impure sperm? I, who am holy and pure, and a part of thy glory. God consoles her. The world which I shall cause thee to enter is better than the world in which thou hast lived hitherto. And when I created thee, it was only for this purpose. The soul is then forced to enter the sperm against her will, and the angel carries her back to the womb of the mother. Two angels are detailed to watch that she shall not leave it, nor drop out of it, and a light is set above her, whereby the soul can see from one end of the world to the other. In the morning an angel carries her to paradise, and shows her the righteous, 
who sit there in their glory, with crowns upon their heads. The angel then says to the soul, Dost thou know who these are? She replies in the negative, and the angel goes on. These whom thou beholdest here were formed, like unto thee, in the womb of their mother. When they came into the world, they observed God's Torah and his commandments. Therefore they became the partakers of this bliss which thou seest them enjoy. Know also thou wilt one day depart from the world below, and if thou wilt observe God's Torah, then wilt thou be found worthy of sitting with these pious ones. But if not, thou wilt be doomed to the other place. In the evening the angel takes the soul to hell, and there points out the sinners whom the angels of destruction are smiting with fiery scourges, the sinners all the while crying out, Woe, woe, but no mercy is shown unto them. The angel then questions the soul as before. Dost thou know who these are? And as before, the reply is negative. The angel continues, These who were consumed with fire were created like unto thee. When they were put into the world, they did not observe God's Torah and his commandments. Therefore have they come to this disgrace which thou seest them suffer. Know thy destiny is also to depart from the world. Be just, therefore, and not wicked, that thou mayest gain the future world. Between morning and evening, the angel carries the soul around, and shows her where she will live and where she will die, and the place where she will be buried. And he takes her through the whole world, and points out the just and the sinners and all things. In the evening, he replaces her in the womb of the mother, and there she remains for nine months. When the time arrives for her to emerge from the womb into the open world, the same angel addresses the soul. The time has come for thee to go abroad into the open world. The soul demurs. Why dost thou want to make me go forth into the open world? The angel replies, Know that, as thou wert formed against thy will, so now thou wilt be born against thy will, and against thy will thou shalt die, and against thy will thou shalt give account to thyself before the King of kings, the Holy One, blessed be he. But the soul is reluctant to leave her place. Then the angel fillips the baby on the nose, extinguishes the light at his head, and brings him forth into the world against his will. Immediately the child forgets all his soul has seen and learnt, and he comes into the world crying, for he loses a place of shelter, and security, and rest. When the time arrives for man to quit this world, the same angel appears and asks him, Dost thou recognize me? And man replies, Yes, but why dost thou come to me today, and thou didst come on no other day? The angel says, To take thee away from the world, for the time of thy departure has arrived. Then man falls to weeping, and his voice penetrates to all ends of the world, yet no creature hears his voice, except the cock alone. Man remonstrates with the angel, From two worlds thou didst take me, and into this world thou didst bring me. But the angel reminds him, Did I not tell you that thou wert formed against thy will, and thou wouldst be born against thy will, and against thy will thou wouldst die? and against thy will thou wilt have to give account and reckoning of thyself before the Holy One. Blessed be he. End of chapter 2, part 1LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Scott. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. The Ideal Man. Like all creatures, formed on the six days of creation, Adam came from the hands of the Creator, fully and completely developed. He was not like a child, 
but like a man of twenty years of age. Twenty-one. The dimensions of his body were gigantic, reaching from heaven to earth, or what amounts to the same, from east to west. Twenty-two. Among later generations of men, there were but few who in measure resembled Adam in his extraordinary size and physical perfections. Samson possessed his strength, Saul his neck, Absalom his hair, Ashahel his fleetness of foot, Uzziah his forehead, Josiah his nostrils, Zedekiah his eyes, Zerubbabel his voice. History shows that these physical excellencies were no blessings to many of their possessors. They invited the ruin of almost all. Samson's extraordinary strength caused his death. Saul killed himself by cutting his neck with his own sword. While speeding swiftly, Ashael was pierced by Abner's spear. Absalom was caught up by his hair in an oak, and thus suspended, met his death. Uzziah was smitten with leprosy upon his forehead. The darts that killed Josiah entered through his nostrils, and Zedekiah's eyes were blinded. 23. The generality of men inherited as little of the beauty as of the portentous size of their first father. The fairest women, compared with Sarah, are as apes compared with a human being. Sarah's relation to Eve is the same, and again Eve was but an ape compared with Adam. His person was so handsome that the very sole of his foot obscured the splendor of the sun. 24. His spiritual qualities kept pace with his personal charm for God had fashioned his soul with particular care. She is the image of God, and as God fills the world, so the soul fills the human body, as God sees all things and is seen by none. So the soul sees, but cannot be seen. As God guides the world, so the soul guides the body. As God in His holiness is pure, so is the soul, and as God dwells in secret, so doth the soul. 25. When God was about to put a soul into Adam's clod-like body, He said, quote, At which point shall I breathe the soul into him? Into the mouth? Nay, for he will use it to speak ill of his fellow man. Into the eyes? With them he will wink lustfully. Into the ears they will hearken to slander and blasphemy. I will breathe her into his nostrils, as they discern the unclean and reject it, and take in the fragrant, so the pious will shun sin and will cleave to the words of the Torah. 26. The perfections of Adam's soul showed themselves as soon as he received her. Indeed, while he was still without life, in the hour that intervened between breathing a soul into the first man and his coming alive, God revealed the whole history of mankind to him. He showed him each generation and its leaders, each generation and its prophets, each generation and its teachers, each generation and its scholars, each generation and its statesmen, each generation and its judges, each generation and its pious members, each generation and its average commonplace members, and each generation its impious members. The tale of their years, the number of their days, the reckoning of their hours, and the measure of their steps, all were made known unto him. 27. Of his own free will, 
Adam relinquished seventy of his allotted years. His appointed span was to be a thousand years, one of the Lord's days. But he said that only a single minute of life was apportioned to the great soul of David, and he made a gift of seventy years to her, reducing his own years to nine hundred and thirty. The wisdom of Adam displayed itself to greatest advantage when he gave names to the animals. Then it appeared that God, in combating the arguments of the angels that opposed the creation of man, had spoken well, when he insisted that man would possess more wisdom than they themselves. When Adam was barely an hour old, God assembled the whole world of animals before him and the angels. The latter were called upon to name the different kinds, but they were not equal to the task. Adam, however, spoke without hesitation, quote, O Lord of the world, the proper name for this animal is ox, for this one horse, for this one lion, for this one camel, end quote. And so he called all in turn by name, suiting the name to the peculiarity of the animal. Then God asked him what his name was to be, and he said, Adam, because he had been created out of Adam. Again, God asked him his own name, quote, Adonai, Lord, because thou art Lord over all creatures. End quote. The very name God had given unto himself, the name by which the angels call him, the name that will remain immutable evermore. 29. But without the gift of the Holy Spirit, Adam could not have found names for all. He was in very truth a prophet, and his wisdom a prophetic quality. 30. The names of the animals were not the only inheritance handed down by Adam to the generations after him, for mankind owes all crafts to him, especially the art of writing, and he was the inventor of all the seventy languages. 31. And still another task he accomplished for his descendants. God showed Adam the whole earth, and Adam designated what places were to be settled later by men, and what places to remain waste. 32. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg, The Fall of Satan. The extraordinary qualities with which Adam was blessed, physical and spiritual as well, aroused the envy of the angels. They attempted to consume him with fire, and he would have perished had not the protecting hand of God rested upon him and established peace between him and the heavenly host. 33. In particular, Satan was jealous of the first man, and his evil thoughts finally led to his fall. After Adam had been endowed with a soul, God invited all the angels to come and pay him reverence and homage. Satan, the greatest of the angels in heaven, with twelve wings, instead of six like all the others, refused to pay heed to the behest of God, saying, quote, Thou didst create us, angels, from the splendor of the Shekinah. And now... Thou dost command us to cast ourselves down before the creature which thou didst fashion out of the dust of the ground? End quote. God answered, quote, Yet this dust of the ground has more wisdom and understanding than thou. End quote. Satan demanded a trial of wit with Adam, and God assented thereto, saying, quote, I have created beasts birds, and reptiles. I shall have them all come before thee and before Adam. 
if thou art able to give them names, I shall command Adam to show honor unto thee, and thou shalt rest next to the Shekinah of my glory. But, if not, and Adam calls them by the names I have assigned to them, then thou wilt be subject to Adam, and he shall have a place in my garden and cultivate it. End quote. Thus spake God, and he betook himself to paradise, Satan following him. When Adam beheld God, he said to his wife, quote, O come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. End quote. Now Satan attempted to assign names to the animals. He failed with the first two that presented themselves, the ox and the cow. God led two others before him, the camel and the donkey, with the same result. Then God turned to Adam and questioned him regarding the names of the same animals. Framing his questions in such wise that the first letter of the first word was the same as the first letter of the name of the animal standing before him. Thus Adam divined the proper name. And Satan was forced to acknowledge the superiority of the first man. Nevertheless, he broke out in wild outcries that reached the heavens, and he refused to do homage unto Adam as he had been bidden. 34. The host of angels, led by him, did likewise, in spite of the urgent representations of Michael, who was the first to prostrate himself before Adam in order to show a good example to the other angels. Michael addressed Satan, quote, Give adoration to the image of God. But if thou dost it not, then the Lord God will break out in wrath against thee. End quote. Satan replied, quote, If he breaks out in wrath against me, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. End quote. At once God flung Satan and his host out of heaven down to the earth, and from that moment dates the enmity between Satan and man. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg Woman When Adam opened his eyes the first time, and beheld the world about him, he broke into praise of God. Quote, how great are thy works, O Lord! End quote but his admiration for the world surrounding him did not exceed the admiration all creatures conceived for Adam. They took him to be their creator, and they all came to offer him adoration. But he spoke, quote, Why do you come to worship me? Nay, you and I together will acknowledge the majesty and the might of him who hath created us all. The Lord reigneth. End quote. He continued, quote, He is apparelled with majesty. End quote. 36. And not alone the creatures on earth, even the angels thought Adam the Lord of all, and they were about to salute him with, quote, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. End quote. When God caused sleep to fall upon him, and then the angels knew that he was but a human being. 37. The purpose of the sleep that enfolded Adam was to give him a wife so that the human race might develop, and all creatures recognize the difference between God and man. When the earth heard what God had resolved to do, it began to tremble and quake. Quote, I have not the strength. End quote it said, quote, to provide for the herd of Adam's descendants, end quote. But God pacified it with the words, quote, I and thou together, we will find food for the herd, end quote. Accordingly, time was divided between God and the earth 
God took the night, and the earth took the day. Refreshing sleep nourishes and strengthens man. It affords him life and rest, while the earth brings forth produce with the help of God, who waters it. Yet man must work the earth to earn his food. 38. The divine resolution to bestow a companion on Adam met the wishes of man, who had been overcome by a feeling of isolation when the animals came to him in pairs to be named. 39. To banish his loneliness, Lilith was first given to Adam as wife. Like him, she had been created out of the dust of the ground, but she remained with him only a short time, because she insisted upon enjoying full equality with her husband. She derived her rights from their identical origin. With the help of the ineffable name, which she pronounced, Lilith flew away from Adam and vanished in the air. Adam complained before God that the wife he had given him had deserted him, and God sent forth three angels to capture her. They found her in the Red Sea, and they sought to make her go back with the threat that, unless she went, she would lose a hundred of her demon children daily by death. But Lilith preferred this punishment to living with Adam. She takes her revenge by injuring babes, baby boys, during the first night of their life while baby girls are exposed to her wicked designs until they are twenty days old. The only way to ward off the evil is to attach an amulet bearing the names of her three angel captors to the children, for such had been the agreement between them. 40. The woman destined to become the true companion of man was taken from Adam's body. For, quote, only when like is joined unto like, the union is indissoluble. End quote. 41. The creation of woman from man was possible, because Adam originally had two faces, which were separated at the birth of Eve. 42. When God was on the point of making Eve, he said, quote, I will not make her from the head of man, lest she carry her head high in arrogant pride, not from the eye, lest she be wanton-eyed, not from the ear, lest she be an eavesdropper, not from the neck, lest she be insolent, not from the mouth, lest she be a tattler, not from the heart, lest she be inclined to envy, not from the hand, lest she be a meddler, not from the foot, lest she be a gadabout, I will form her from a chaste portion of the body, End quote. and to every limb and organ as he formed it, God said, quote, Be chaste, be chaste. End quote. Nevertheless, in spite of the great caution used, woman has all the faults God tried to obviate. The daughters of Zion were haughty and walked with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. Sarah was an eavesdropper in her own tent, when the angel spoke with Abraham. Miriam was a tale-bearer, accusing Moses. Rachel was envious of her sister Leah. Eve put out her hand to take the forbidden fruit, and Dinah was a gadabout. 43. The physical formation of woman is far more complicated than that of man, as it must be for the function of childbearing, and, likewise, the intelligence of woman matures more quickly than the intelligence of man. 44. Many of the physical and psychical differences between the two sexes must be attributed to the fact that man was formed from the ground, and woman from the bone. Women need perfumes, while men do not. Dust of the ground remains the same, no matter how long it is kept. Flesh, however, requires salt 
to keep it in good condition. The voice of woman is shrill, not so the voice of men. When soft viands are cooked, no sound is heard, but let a bone be put in a pot, and at once it crackles. A man is easily placated, not so a woman. A few drops of water suffice to soften a clod of earth. A bone stays hard, and if it were to soak in water four days. The man must ask the woman to be his wife, and not the woman the man to be her husband, because it is man who has sustained the loss of his rib, and he sallies forth to make good his loss again. The very difference between the sexes in garb and social forms goes back to the origin of man and woman for their reasons. Woman covers her hair in token of Eve's having brought sin into the world. She tries to hide her shame, and women precede men in funeral cordage, because it was woman who brought death into the world. And the religious commands addressed to women alone are connected with the history of Eve. Adam was the heave offering of the world, and Eve defiled it. As expiation, all women are commanded to separate a heave offering from the dough, and because woman extinguished the light of man's soul, she is bidden to kindle the Sabbath light. 45. Adam was first made to fall into a deep sleep before the rib for Eve was taken from his side. For had he watched her creation, she would not have awakened love in him. To this day, it is true that men do not appreciate the charms of women whom they have known and observed from childhood up. Indeed, God had created a wife for Adam before Eve, but he would not have her, because she had been made in his presence. Knowing well all the details of her formation, he was repelled by her. 46. But when he roused himself from his profound sleep, and saw Eve before him in all her surpassing beauty and grace, he exclaimed, quote, This is she who caused my heart to throb many a night. End quote. Yet he discerned at once what the nature of woman was. She would, he knew, seek to carry her point with man either by entreaties and tears or flattery and caresses. He said, therefore, quote, This is my never silent bell. End quote. 47. The wedding of the first couple was celebrated with pomp, never repeated in the whole course of history since. God himself, before presenting her to Adam, attired and adorned Eve as a bride. Yea, he appealed to the angels, saying, quote, Come, let us perform services of friendship for Adam and his helpmate, for the world rests upon friendly services, and they are more pleasing in my sight than the sacrifices Israel will offer upon the altar. End quote. The angels accordingly surrounded the marriage canopy, and God pronounced the blessings upon the bridal couple, as the Hazan does under the hoopah. The angels then danced and played upon musical instruments before Adam and Eve in their bridal chambers of gold, pearls, and precious stones, which God had prepared for them. And Adam called his wife Aisha and himself he called Ish, abandoning the name Adam, which he had borne before the creation of Eve, for the reason that God added his own name, Yah, to the names of the man and the woman, Yad to Ish, and he to Isha, to indicate that as long as they walked in the ways of God, and observed his commandments, his name would shield them against all harm. But if they went astray, his name would be withdrawn, and instead of Ish, 
there would remain esh, fire, a fire issuing from each and consuming the other. 48. End of chapter 2, part 2. The Ideal Man, The Fall of Satan, Woman. Read by Robert Scott, July the 5th, 2007. Two, Adam. Part two of the Legend of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Scott. The Legends of the Jews, Volume One. Adam and Eve in Paradise The Garden of Eden was the abode of the first man and woman, and the souls of all men must pass through it after death, before they reach their final destination, for the souls of the departed must go through seven portals before they arrive in the heaven, Arabat. There the souls of the pious are transformed into angels, and there they remain forever, praising God and feasting their sight upon the glory of the Shekinah. The first portal is the cave of Machpelah, in the vicinity of Paradise, which is under the care and supervision of Adam. If the soul that presents herself at the portal is worthy, he calls out, quote, Make room, thou art welcome. End quote. The soul then proceeds until she arrives at the gates of paradise, guarded by the cherubim and the flaming sword. If she is not found worthy, she is consumed by the sword. Otherwise, she receives a pass bill, which admits her to the terrestrial paradise. Therein is a pillar of smoke and light extending from paradise to the gate of heaven and it depends upon the character of the soul whether she can climb upward on it and reach heaven. The third portal, Zebul, is at the entrance of heaven. If the soul is worthy, the guard opens the portal and admits her to the heavenly temple. Michael presents her to God and conducts her to the seventh portal. Michael presents her to God and conducts her to the seventh portal. Arabot, within which the souls of the pious change to angels, praise the Lord, and feed on the glory of the Shekinah. 49. In paradise stand the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, the latter forming a hedge about the former. Only he who has cleared a path for himself through the tree of knowledge can come close to the tree of life, which is so huge that it would take a man five hundred years to traverse a distance equal to the diameter of the trunk, and no less vast is the space shaded by its crown of branches. For beneath it flows forth the water that irrigates the whole earth. 50. Parting thence into four streams, the Ganges, the Nile, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. 51. But it was only during the days of creation that the realm of plants looked to the waters of the earth for nourishment. Later on, God made the plants depend upon the rain, the upper waters. The clouds rise from heaven to earth, where water is poured into them as from a conduit. 52. The plants began to feel the effect of the water only after Adam was created, although they had been brought forth on the third day. God did not permit them to sprout and appear above the surface of the earth until Adam prayed to him to give food unto them, for God longs for the prayers of the pious. 53. Paradise 
being such as it was, it was, naturally, not necessary for Adam to work the land. True, the Lord God put the man into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it, but that only means he is to study the Torah there and fulfill the commandments of God. 54. There were especially six commandments which every human being is expected to heed. Man should not worship idols, nor blaspheme God, nor commit murder, nor incest, nor theft and robbery. And all generations have the duty of instituting measures of law and order. 55. One more such command there was, but it was a temporary injunction. Adam was to eat only the green things of the field. But the prohibition against the use of animals for food was revoked in Noah's time, after the deluge. Nevertheless, Adam was not cut off from the enjoyment of meat dishes, though he was not permitted to slaughter animals for the appeasing of his appetite. The angels brought him meat and wine, serving him like attendants. 56. And as the angels ministered to his wants, so also the animals. They were wholly under his dominion, and their food they took out of his hand and out of Eve's. 57. In all respects, the animal world had a different relation to Adam from their relation to his descendants. Not only did they know the language of man, 58, but they respected the image of God, and they feared the first human couple, all of which changed into the opposite, after the fall of man, 59. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, Rabbi Louis Ginsburg, The Fall of Man. Among the animals, the serpent was notable. Of all of them, he had the most excellent qualities, in some of which he resembled man. Like man, he stood upright upon two feet, and in height he was equal to the camel. Had it not been for the fall of man, which brought misfortune to them, too, one pair of serpents would have sufficed to perform all the work man has to do. And besides, they would have supplied him with silver, gold, gems, and pearls. As a matter of fact, it was the variability of the serpent that led to the ruin of man, and his own ruin. His superior mental gifts caused him to become an infidel. It likewise explains his envy of man, especially of his conjugal relations. Envy made him meditate ways and means of bringing about the death of Adam. 60. He was too well acquainted with the character of man to attempt to exercise tricks of persuasion upon him, and he approached the woman. Knowing that women are beguiled easily, the conversation with Eve was cunningly planned. She could not but be caught in a trap. The serpent began, quote, Is it true that God hath said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? End quote. Quote, we may, end quote, rejoined Eve, quote, eat of the fruit of all trees in the garden, except that which is in the midst of the garden, and that we may not even touch, lest we be stricken with death. End quote. She spoke thus, because in his zeal to guard her against the transgressing of the divine command, Adam, had forbidden even to touch the tree, though God had mentioned only the eating of the fruit. It remains a truth what the proverb says, quote, Better a wall ten hands high that stands than a wall a hundred ells high that cannot stand. End quote. It was Adam's exaggeration that afforded the serpent 
the possibility of persuading Eve to taste the forbidden fruit. The serpent pushed Eve against the tree and said, quote, Thou seest that touching the tree has not caused thy death, as little will it hurt thee to eat the fruit of the tree. Naught but malevolence has prompted the prohibition. For as soon as ye eat thereof, ye shall be as God. As he creates and destroys worlds, so will ye have the power to create and destroy. As he doth slay and revive, so will ye have the power to slay and revive. 61. He himself ate first of the fruit of the tree, and then he created the world. Therefore doth he forbid you to eat thereof, lest you create other worlds. Everyone knows that artisans of the same guild hate one another. Furthermore, have ye not observed that every creature hath dominion over the creature fashioned before itself? The heavens were made on the first day, and they are kept in place by the firmament made on the second day. The firmament, in turn, is ruled by the plants, the creation of the third day, for they take up all the water of the firmament. The sun and the other celestial bodies, which were created on the fourth day, have power over the world of plants. They can ripen their fruits and flourish only through their influence. The creation of the fifth day, the animal world, rules over the celestial spheres. Witness the ziz, which can darken the sun with its pinions. But ye are masters of the whole of creation, because ye were the last to be created. Hasten now, and eat of the fruit of the tree, in the midst of the garden, and become independent of God, lest he bring forth still other creatures to bear rule over you. End quote. 62. To give due weight to these words, the serpent began to shake the tree violently and bring down its fruit. He ate thereof, saying, quote, As I do not die of eating the fruit, so wilt thou not die. End quote. Now Eve could not but say to herself, quote, All that my master, end quote, so she called Adam, quote, commanded me is but lies. End quote and she determined to follow the advice of the serpent. 63. Yet she could not bring herself to disobey the command of God utterly. She made a compromise with her conscience. First, she ate only the outside skin of the fruit, and then, seeing that death did not fell her, she ate the fruit itself. 64. Scarce had she finished when she saw the angel of death before her. Expecting her end to come immediately, she resolved to make Adam eat of the forbidden fruit too, lest he espouse another wife after her death. 65. It required tears and lamentations on her part to prevail upon Adam to take the baleful step. Not yet satisfied, she gave of the fruit to all the other living beings, that they too might be subjected to death. 66. All ate, and they all are mortal, with the exception of the bird, Malham, who refused the fruit, with the words, quote, Is it not enough that ye have sinned against God, and have brought death to others? Must ye still come to me? and seek to persuade me into disobeying God's command, that I may eat and die thereof? I will not do your bidding. End quote. A heavenly voice was heard then to say to Adam and Eve, quote, To you was the command given. You did not heed it. You did transgress it. And ye did seek to persuade the bird, Malham. He was steadfast, and he feared me, although I gave him no command. 
Therefore he shall never taste of death, neither he nor his descendants. They all shall live forever in paradise. End quote. 67. Adam spoke to Eve, quote, Didst thou give me of the tree of which I forbade thee to eat? Thou didst give me thereof, for my eyes are opened, and the teeth in my mouth are set on edge. End quote. Eve made answer, quote, As my teeth were set on edge, so may the teeth of all living beings be set on edge. End quote. 68. The first result was that Adam and Eve became naked. Before, their bodies had been overlaid with a horny skin and enveloped with the cloud of glory. No sooner had they violated the command given them than the cloud of glory and the horny skin dropped from them, and they stood there in their nakedness and ashamed. 69. Adam tried to gather leaves from the trees to cover part of their bodies, but he heard one tree after the other say, quote, there is the thief that deceived his creator. Nay, the foot of pride shall not come down against me, nor the hand of the wicked touch me. Hence, and take no leaves from me. End quote. Only the fig tree granted him permission to take of its leaves. That was because the fig tree was the forbidden fruit itself. Adam had the same experience as that prince who seduced one of the maidservants in the palace. When the king, his father, chased him out, he vainly sought a refuge with the other maidservants, but only she who had caused his disgrace would grant him assistance. 70. End of chapter 2, part 3 Read by Robert Scott July the 7th, 2007. Chapter 2, Adam, Part 4 of The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 1, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. The Punishment As long as Adam stood naked, casting about for means of escape from his embarrassment, God did not appear unto him, for one should not, quote, strive to see a man in the hour of his disgrace. End quote. He waited until Adam and Eve had covered themselves with fig leaves. But even before God spoke to him, Adam knew what was impending. He heard the angels announce, quote, God betaketh himself unto those that dwell in paradise. End quote. He heard more, too. He heard what the angels were saying to one another about his fall, and what they were saying to God. In astonishment, the angels exclaimed, quote, What? He still walks about in paradise? He is not yet dead? End quote. Whereupon God, quote, I said to him, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, ye know not what manner of day I meant, one of my days of a thousand years, or one of your days. I will give him one of my days. He shall have nine hundred and thirty years to live, and seventy to leave to his descendants. End quote. When Adam and Eve heard God approaching, they hid among the trees, 
which would not have been possible before the fall. Before he committed his trespass, Adam's height was from the heavens to the earth, but afterward it was reduced to one hundred ells. Another consequence of his sin was the fear Adam felt when he heard the voice of God. Before his fall, it had not disquieted him in the least. Hence, it was that when Adam said, quote, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. End quote. God replied, quote, Afore time thou wert not afraid, and now thou art afraid. End quote. God refrained from reproaches at first. Standing at the gate of paradise, he but asked, quote, Where art thou, Adam? End quote. Thus did God desire to teach man a rule of polite behavior, never to enter the house of another without announcing himself. It cannot be denied the words, quote, Where art thou? End quote were pregnant with meaning. They were intended to bring home to Adam the vast difference between his latter and his former state, between his supernatural size then and his shrunken size now, between the lordship of God over him then and the lordship of the serpent over him now. At the same time, God wanted to give Adam the opportunity of repenting of his sin, and he would have received divine forgiveness for it. But so far from repenting of it, Adam slandered God and uttered blasphemies against him. When God asked him, quote, Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee? thou shouldst not eat, end quote. He did not confess his sin, but excused himself with the words, quote, O Lord of the world, as long as I was alone, I did not fall into sin, but as soon as this woman came to me, she tempted me, end quote. God replied, quote, I gave her unto thee as a help, and thou art ungrateful when thou accusest her, saying, She gave me of the tree. Thou shouldst not have obeyed her, for thou art the head and not she. End quote. God, who knows all things, had foreseen exactly this, and he did not create Eve until Adam had asked him, for a helpmate, so that he might not have apparently good reason for reproaching God with having created woman. As Adam tried to shift the blame for his misdeed from himself, so also Eve. She, like her husband, did not confess her transgression and pray for pardon which would have been granted to her. Gracious as God is, he did not pronounce the doom upon Adam and Eve until they showed themselves stiff-necked. Not so with the serpent. God inflicted the curse upon the serpent without hearing his defense. For the serpent is a villain, and the wicked are good debaters. If God had questioned him, the serpent would have answered, quote, Thou didst give them a command, and I did contradict it. Why did they obey me, and not thee? End quote. Therefore, God did not enter into an argument with the serpent, but straightway decreed the following ten punishments. The mouth of the serpent was closed, and his power of speech taken away. His hands and feet 
were hacked off. The earth was given him as food. He must suffer great pain in slothing his skin. Enmity is to exist between him and man. If he eats the choicest viands, or drinks the sweetest beverages, they all change into dust in his mouth. The pregnancy of the female serpent lasts seven years. Men shall seek to kill him as soon as they catch sight of him, even in the future world, where all beings will be blessed, he will not escape the punishment decreed for him. He will vanish from out of the holy land if Israel walks in the ways of God. Furthermore, God spake to the serpent, Quote, I created thee to be king over all animals, cattle, and the beasts of the field alike, but thou wast not satisfied. Therefore thou shalt be cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. I created thee of upright posture, but thou wast not satisfied. Therefore thou shalt go upon thy belly, I created thee to eat the same food as man, but thou wast not satisfied. Therefore thou shalt eat dust all the days of thy life. Thou didst seek to cause the death of Adam in order to espouse his wife. Therefore I will put enmity between thee and the woman. End quote. How true it is! He who lusts after what is not his due, not only does he not attain his desire, but he also loses what he has. The angels had been present when the doom was pronounced upon the serpent, for God had convoked a Sanhedrin of seventy-one angels when he sat in judgment upon him. So the execution of the decree against him was entrusted to the angels. They descended from heaven and chopped off his hands and feet. His suffering was so great that his agonized cries could be heard from one end of the world to the other. The verdict against Eve also consisted of ten curses the effect of which is noticeable to this day in the physical, spiritual, and social state of women. It was not God himself who announced her fate to Eve. The only woman with whom God ever spoke was Sarah. In the case of Eve, he made use of the services of an interpreter. Finally, also the punishment of Adam was tenfold. He lost his celestial clothing. God stripped it off him. In sorrow, he was to earn his daily bread. The food he ate was to be turned from good into bad. His children were to wander from land to land. His body was to exude sweat. He was to have an evil inclination. In death, his body was to be a prey of the worms. Animals were to have power over him, and that they could slay him. His days were to be few and full of trouble. In the end, he was to render account of all his doings on earth. These three sinners were not the only ones to have punishment dealt out to them. The earth fared no better, for it had been guilty of various misdemeanors. In the first place, it had not entirely heeded the command of God, given on the third day, to bring forth, quote, tree of fruit, end quote. What God had desired was a tree the wood of which was to be as pleasant to the taste as the fruit thereof. 
The earth, however, produced a tree bearing fruit, the tree itself not being edible. Again, the earth did not do its whole duty in connection with the sin of Adam. God had appointed the sun and the earth witnesses to testify against Adam in case he committed a trespass. The sun, accordingly, had grown dark the instant Adam became guilty of disobedience, but the earth, not knowing how to take notice of Adam's fall, disregarded it altogether. The earth also had to suffer a tenfold punishment, independent before, she was hereafter to wait to be watered by the rain from above. Sometimes the fruits of the earth fail, the grain she brings forth is stricken with blasting and mildew. She must produce all sorts of noxious vermin. Thenceforth she was to be divided into valleys and mountains, she must grow barren trees, bearing no fruit. Thorns and thistles sprout from her. Much is sown in the earth, but little is harvested. In time to come, the earth will have to disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain, and finally she shall one day wax old like a garment. When Adam heard the words, quote, Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth, end quote, concerning the ground, a sweat broke out of his face, and he said, quote, What, shall I and my cattle eat from the same manger? End quote. The Lord had mercy upon him and spoke, quote, In view of the sweat of thy face, Thou shalt eat thy bread. End quote. The earth is not the only thing created that was made to suffer through the sin of Adam. The same fate overtook the moon when the serpent seduced Adam and Eve and exposed their nakedness. They wept bitterly, and with them wept the heavens and the sun and the stars and all created beings and things up to the throne of God. The very angels and the celestial beings were grieved by the transgression of Adam. The moon alone laughed, wherefore God grew wroth and obscured her light. Instead of shining steadily like the sun all the length of the day, she grows old quickly, and must be born and reborn again and again. The callous conduct of the moon offended God, not only by way of contrast with the compassion of all other creatures, but because he himself was full of pity for Adam and his wife. He made clothes for them out of the skin stripped from the serpent, he would have done more. He would have permitted them to remain in paradise if only they had been penitent. But they refused to repent, and they had to leave, lest their godlike understanding urge them to ravage the tree of life. And they learned to live forever. As it was, when God dismissed them from paradise, he did not allow the divine quality of justice to prevail entirely. He associated mercy with it. As they left, he said, quote, Oh, what a pity that Adam was not able to observe the command laid upon him for even a brief span of time. End quote. To guard the entrance of paradise, God appointed the cherubim, called also the ever-turning sword of flames, because angels can turn themselves from one shape into another at need. 
instead of the tree of life, God gave Adam the Torah, which likewise is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and he was permitted to take up his abode in the vicinity of paradise in the east. Sentence pronounced upon Adam and Eve and the serpent, the Lord commanded the angels to turn the man and the woman out of paradise. They began to weep and supplicate bitterly, and the angels took pity upon them and left the divine command unfulfilled until they could petition God to mitigate his severe verdict. But the Lord was inexorable, saying, quote, Was it I that committed a trespass, or did I pronounce a false judgment? End quote. Also, Adam's prayer to be given of the fruit of the tree of life was turned aside, with the promise, however, that if he would lead a pious life, he would be given the fruit on the day of resurrection, and he would then live forever. Seeing that God had resolved unalterably, Adam began to weep again and implore the angels to grant him at least permission to take sweet-scented spices with him out of paradise that outside, too, he might be able to bring offerings unto God, and his prayers be accepted before the Lord. Thereupon the angels came before God and spake, quote, King, unto everlasting, command thou us to give Adam sweet-scented spices of paradise. End quote. And God heard their prayer. Thus Adam gathered saffron, nard, calamus, and cinnamon, and all sorts of seeds besides for his sustenance. Laden with these, Adam and Eve left paradise and came upon earth. They had enjoyed the splendors of paradise but a brief span of time, but a few hours. It was in the first hour of the sixth day of creation that God conceived the idea of creating man. In the second hour, he took counsel with the angels. In the third, he gathered the dust for the body of man. In the fourth, he formed Adam. In the fifth, he clothed him with skin. In the sixth, the soulless shape was complete, so that it could stand upright. In the seventh, a soul was breathed into it. In the eighth, man was led into paradise. In the ninth, the divine command prohibiting the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden was issued to him. In the tenth, he transgressed the command. In the eleventh he was judged, and in the twelfth hour of the day he was cast out of paradise in atonement for his sin. This eventful day was the first of the month of Tishiri. Therefore God spoke to Adam, quote, Thou shalt be the prototype of thy children and thou hast been judged by me on this day, and absolved. So thy children, Israel, shall be judged by me on this New Year's day, and they shall be absolved. End quote. Each day of creation brought forth three things, the first, heaven, earth, and light, the second, the firmament, Gehenna, and the angels, the third, trees, herbs, and paradise, the fourth, sun, moon, and stars, and the fifth, fishes, birds, and leviathan.
as God intended to rest on the seventh day, the Sabbath, the sixth day had to do double duty. It brought forth six creations, Adam, Eve, cattle, reptiles, the beasts of the field, and demons. The demons were made shortly before the Sabbath came in, and they are, therefore, in corporeal spirits. The Lord had no time to create bodies for them. In the twilight, between the sixth day and the Sabbath, ten creations were brought forth. The rainbow, invisible until Noah's time, the manna, water springs, whence Israel drew water for his thirst in the desert. The writing upon the two tables of stone gave at Sinai, the pen with which the writing was written, the two tables themselves, the mouth of Balaam's Sheas, the grave of Moses, the cave in which Moses and Elijah dwelt, and the rod of Aaron, with its blossoms and its ripe almonds. End of chapter 2, part 4 Recording by Robert Scott, July the 28th, 2007